This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with SICA. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, L. John Polite, Jr., and the Friends of Firing Line. Uh, we are here to ponder in what direction should President Clinton move. It is tempting to say that he will move in every direction, uh, so full of energy is he, and so various are the proposals uh, made to him and the commitments made by him. An enormous and quite interesting book has been got together called Changing America, uh, Blueprints for the New Administration. It devotes a chapter of modest size to every problem in America, with the possible exception of original sin. <laughs> and what you know, it's edited by our old friend, Mark Green. <clears throat> the screen has been many times on firing line, though not unhappily in recent days. He is the most mobilized Democrat in the United States, a former Democratic senatorial candidate, head of New York's Department of Consumer Affairs. He went to Cornell and then to the Harvard Law School, where he was editor in chief of the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review. He went then as principal associate to uh, Ralph Nader before deciding to give all or most of his time to liberating uh, New York. In a half hour, there aren't too many points we can hope to cover. <coughs> so I would like to discuss one item in particular that appears on the agenda of both Mr. Green and Mr. Clinton. Uh, it has to do with facilitating the registration of voters. A bill is being considered that would require state motor vehicle bureaus <coughs> to give anyone who shows up to get a driving license or a renewal for a driving license the opportunity to register there and then as a voter. I think this is a lousy idea. And I would like to ask Mr. Green why it is favored in the book he has edited and by the president I am certain he voted for. Um, America's civic faith is democracy, Bill said William Grider in his book, Who Will Tell the People. The problem is we're not going to church or temple or our mosques often enough, often enough to pray to it. We have a democracy without citizenship. I mean, it is amazing that we have the world's oldest democracy, yet 80% of the people turn out and vote in Canada, Great Britain, um, Israel, France, while in off-year elections, congressional elections, it's a third in this country. What do you do? Why is that true? A century ago, we created a registration system at that time, not now, but at that time, among its motivations was to keep out foreigners and minorities from voting, making it, giving them one more hurdle before they could vote. With the result, I think that that's among the reasons voting is so relatively infrequent in this country. Now, you may want only Yale college graduates to vote, and I respect God, your point no. of view. <laughs> but I, I think everybody should, should have a chance to vote. Um, wait, 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 in the first place, uh, stop. Everybody has a chance to vote. The question is whether there ought to be reasonable requirements. Now, uh, in uh, our century, we have seen the vote given to women, good. We have seen votes <laughs> given to, to blacks, good. We have seen votes given to illiterates, bad. The notion that there ought to be some process uh, uh, through which one has to pass before one votes is, I think, a deliberative uh, concession to the requirements of thoughtful voting. The, the vision of great truckloads of people being run by Tammany Hall and driven with a lot of beer there uh, to vote uh, for Kennedy uh, alphabetically, as happened in one precinct in Chicago in 1960, uh, is uh, a, a defamation of democracy, in my judgment. <clears throat> and it doesn't surprise me that Mr. Clinton, uh, given his uh, 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 eclectic uh, appetite for popularity, should want to do that. Well, your anecdotal analysis of Kennedy's election doesn't work in a country where Tammany Hall in a country of 250 million is a television set. You can't truck enough people to an election to, uh, to make a difference. Now, you can if it's a critical district. 
if the turnout is How 100 many people. 400 people created Landslide Linden, didn't they? Yeah. Including called, my grandfather. It's called organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot, under the First Amendment, ban a labor union or a political machine from busting people to the polls. But the more important issue is, um, you said, gee, illiterates shouldn't vote, and should there not be some minimal threshold? First of all, why in the world shouldn't illiterates vote? Just because they're not literate or intelligent by your standards. They have interest as important to them as yours are to you. They can understand what's going on, um, if not as well as someone who's literate. Then you should have an IQ test, because someone of 140 IQ certainly knows more than someone who's 80 and is literate, right? Look, look, first bit, you're, you're talking to a man who, 25 years ago, said I will sooner be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston telephone book than by the faculty of Harvard. And that so don't do always, this elite business on me. That quote has always uh, survived because uh, it was so anomalous coming from you. Well, no, it was so true, <laughs> uh, and, and therefore, uh, 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 therefore very comfortable with my other Bill, truths. assume we disagree yeah. on whether illiterates or not should vote. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, take your assumption that they Which they not. couldn't do up until about 25 years ago. Well, nor could 18-year-olds. This is called progress. Here's the question. Well, how what about if you have a, What if you have a... We had te literacy tests in the South, and they were used, as I think you would acknowledge, to weed out not people who were illiterate, but by and large yes. people who were black. That's what we lawyers call the abusive process. Now, therefore, would you do you support literacy tests in the South, knowing that that was the real world result of your concept? Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, I, I put it once this way, I think to you, uh, it was established, I think, eight or 10 years ago, that 20% uh, of the American people had never heard of the United Nations. Now, it seems to me if we could actually locate those 20 people, 20% of you, we ought to say to them, would you please mind not voting until you hear about the United Nations because it's really quite an important factor Bill, in your knowledge. Bill, James Watt, the, the secretary under Reagan, had never heard of the Holocaust, he said in office. Ronald Reagan. No, 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 in the first place, I don't believe that, and you shouldn't believe it. Why? Uh, he, he probably knew it under a different name. A different name? Yeah. Oh, that Holocaust. No, no, the Holocaust, as you know, is ne was never used popularly until about seven or eight years ago. Uh, Weisel said that. The uh, Holocaust became distinctive to what happened in Germany seven or eight years ago. The, uh, uh, the, the, the point surely uh, is the point made by the greatest bard of the Universal franchise, uh, John Stuart Mill, and he said, uh, A, everybody should vote, B, but of course nobody should vote who votes other than for the interests of the commonweal. Now, the interests of the commonweal are very difficult to measure by somebody who doesn't know uh, that there's a thing called the United Nations. Uh, voter registration systems create a ridiculous and unnecessary hurdle to participation. India and my college fraternity a couple of de decades ago had a simple system. They would uh, brand you with a little uh, indelible ink if you went into the party so they knew that you were entitled to be there. India puts a little indelible ink on someone, so if you try to vote twice, they look and see, oh, sorry, you've already voted. Mm -hmm. That's all we need to deter voter fraud. What's happening is recent presidents have not been, have been arguing that more voter registration could lead to more voter fraud, when I think they're really more afraid of more voters, more participation, and it wouldn't be the people voting for them. Well, uh, people who don't take, uh, by the way, uh, in, in Connecticut, where I, I live and where I vote, you, uh, I registered when I was 21, which you then had to be, which was many years ago. You never have to register again. Uh, so it, it, it isn't the way it is in some states where you have to register each time. Uh, let me interrupt my narrative to ask, why should the federal government specify in lieu of the state what ought to be the requirements for a vote? Well, uh, the Constitution establishes very minimal requirements, 25 years old to run for Congress, 30 for the Senate. To go much beyond that, I think, is inappropriate. The state is allowed to decide the hours of voting. Now, if the state decided to vote, you could vote only between uh, noon and 1 p.m., mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that would be so constricting that the federal government might, in this hypothetical, argue that it limits the right to vote. Mm -hmm. But except for something in extreme like that, I think the state should determine uh, the hours and the access. Well, and the registration requirements. Well, what happens, though, is if you have registration requirements as bad as the Old South, or something tantamount to it, you are de facto weeding out people. I, I, wish, I wish you wouldn't weaken your argument by pointing to abuses of it. I, mean, I can avoid to point to abuses of free speech without saying we ought to repeal the First Amendment. Would you support literacy tests, then? 
You can't get away from the fact would. that of an implementation is, is, is he, unconstitutional. Yeah, I, would, I, would I would oppose literacy tests, and I would oppose you any test conducted other than in English. But you said illiterates shouldn't vote. How can you tell? How do you test it? Well, by asking them to read. Uh. Now, you know, there, there is the, 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 of course there is the abuse. The, the old colored fellow who was given something in Greek to read, the, uh, it says here, no nigger's going to vote today, a, a famous uh, ribald uh, racist joke. So I don't deny that this, this happened, but this is an abuse. I'm talking about a, a state that says uh, voting is a civic sacrament. Uh, one ought to make certain preparations of it. And one preparation is the solemnity of going through a certain process. We want them to register, meaning that they have an interest in the political process, even though it requires half an hour of their time. You said it's the year of the state. It's the year right. of the middle class revolution. The middle is furious, Bill, because they've been politically shut out of the process. Why didn't they vote? Well, but first... You said only a third of them voted. In off-year elections. Actually, <clears throat> in 1992, for the first time in 30 years, voting in a presidential election year went up. You're right, they not, voted not more. Much, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It went from 50% in 88 to 56% uh, this year, which shocked everyone, even yeah. the experts. The reason? Uh, Perot's 19 percent, the most of a third party candidate who wasn't prior a ma major party candidate in history. Um, and they came out to vote not because they are apathetic, but because they're angry. And um, this could lead to an idea whose time is coming, which I personally don't like. I don't know your position on a, term limits. A revolution? On term limits. Yeah, that, that is a revolution. <laughs> uh, federally, it would be. And I think we should do everything rational in terms of campaign finance reform, lobbying reform, uh, registration reform, to bring in the people who have been shut out of the process because the economic elites have this pay-per-view Congress that apparently they can afford because of the money they put up. And I've been a critic of it, and, uh, and uh, where are you? I, I, I'm trying to get, uh, catch the second act. You went from the first to the third. Wh how, what is it that we've done to keep people from voting, and how did we manage? All right. Um, People who earn over $50,000 a year vote at twice the rate of people who earn under $10,000 well, a year. Well, does uh, that surprise you? Uh, I deplore it. Part of the reason is the voting registration hurdles that don't bother you. Part of the reason is when you think as a citizen your vote doesn't count because under Baker v. Carr, one person, one vote, mm. but under the modern politics, one PAC, political action committee, many votes, you have a system of potentially purchase politicians where a small economic elite has such a larger say than the public, to quote President Clinton, the voices yep. of privilege and power drown out the citizens. It's not a democracy. From, from somebody speaking from the party that has been in command of gerrymandering for the last three decades, <coughs> you, you really ought to be embarrassed to say what you just said. Uh, it, it looks like Rorschach tests the gerrymanders built in almost every case by Democratic administrations in the state in order to accommodate the kind of voter you're talking about. The, the fact of the matter is that there is a certain amount of indifference. By the way, that's not all bad. As Max that's not Eastman, all bad. As, uh, indifference. As Max Eastman pointed out, the Democratic instrument is primarily an instrument by which people can be rejected. Uh, and uh, when they feel uh, outraged enough to vote against the existing order, they show up in order to reject. So it's primarily a negative instrument. But by, by assuming that, by turning this handle or that handle, I can dictate what's going to be the subsidy for farmers or the import duty on Toyota. No, we don't have plebiscite. It's, it's ridiculous. We just vote for people who we think have integrity and intelligence. Because while we may not know, I certainly don't, what the milk price support should be on a given Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I hope to elect someone of judgment and fair-mindedness to let them decide. Bill, if, if a coal mine... But judgment and fair-minded view means a Democrat, a left, left Democrat. Excuse me? It means a left Democrat. I would have voted for you in 65 if no one else was running. <laughs> um, let's oh, think... you, you mean if I had if I had it assured? I was too young at the time. Uh, Bill ran for mayor, and uh, pending a recount, you didn't win. Um, <laughs> on democracy, if a plane crashes, if a building collapses, you can blame the architect. How do you know that a democracy is collapsing? If 50 percent vote, we're a democracy. What if 10 percent turned out? In, in local school board elections in New York, I'm sure elsewhere, 3 percent turn out. Well, well that's a joke. Uh, and at a certain point, you lose so much altitude 
that the system you're lauding doesn't exist. I want to make sure more people participate. They're not squeezed out by the big donors. They have a chance to no, vote. I, I, I and you want fewer participants, yeah. little less participation? I, I, I agree with you more. But I think this is primarily a factor of the elongation between the voter and what happens. As we continue uh, in our, our centripetal fury, uh, giving more and more authority to uh, Washington, D.C., we, we, we feel, what in the hell can I, as an individual voter, do to affect that policy? Uh, did you notice that during the last campaign, everybody was talking about what, do we, what should Washington do to look after mothers, children, when they go off to work? It never occurred to them to say, nothing. Leave it to Albany to do. Leave it to Hartford to do. Uh, let them take into account local conditions. But uh, as it becomes a Washington decision, who's going to look after my children, you feel, well, what the hell's the point of voting? Well, there are some things that are uniquely national. Social Security and defense work mm -hmm. best in a unified way out of Washington. Some yeah. things are particularly local, education and the police function. Your children's example is an interesting one. A major proposal in changing America by both Marion Wright Edelman, mm -hmm. who's a liberal, and Elaine K. Mark, who's a more conservative Democrat, is a refundable child care credit. So part of your income is not taxed at all if it's used to raise a child, which is intelligent. The government shouldn't take your money and then cheat your child. Now that comes out of Washington because, like it or not, there is a thing called federal income tax. Well, well and the federal income tax allows uh, X $2,000 per dependent. Correct. Now, uh, that, if that were raised realistically, uh, and, and were indexed, that $2,000 would be about seven or $8,000 now, in which case it would automatically compensate you for the costs of hiring a babysitter. Uh, that's exactly what we're urging, that it be raised Especially to seven Zoe, or 8000 Especially as Zoe Moore bears prices. We're urging it be raised to seven or $8,000, which, it's real money, if you limit it to families with children of four years old or younger, mm -hmm. is a lost revenue of $10 billion. Mm -hmm. An investment in children of $10 billion, which you have to make up, uh, you have to make up somewhere else. Because you can abort more. You can abort more? Abort more children and, and less deficit. I, I, I don't get your drift, but... I yes, you do. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice device of yours. Pretend you don't get it. I will say, though, uh, on the point of registration and democracy, Bill Clinton, personally and politically, is probably committed to this. Uh, um, politically, he sees this 19% of the Perot vote. He and Nixon, as you know, got the same percentage. Nixon, 43% in 1968, Clinton, 43%. Both had third-party candidates, Wallace and Perot. Mm -hmm. Nixon succeeded in 1972 because he won over the lion's share of the Wallace third-party vote. Bill Clinton is looking at the Perot vote, and part of it is we're mad at the guys with slick shoes and big money who yeah. have shut us out of the system, right. a kind of nadir Perot populism. Mm -hmm. Clinton personally shares that view intellectually, but politically, mm -hmm. Doesn't have much alternative. So therefore, he wants to create more voters. Sure. Yeah. I think out of belief, but also out of uh, party self-interest. If the Democratic Party gets more people to vote, and if Clinton performs, mm. on his shoulders resides now the future of the Democratic Party, mm. the new Democratic Party, to use his phrase. Why not give voters who make under ten thousand dollars two votes each? Well, actually, well, that'll be the next Democratic Party. I appreciate your authoritarian humor. But Australia requires voting. Yeah. Requires voting. And Don Stewart Mill said that people on welfare shouldn't vote at all. Uh, three hundred year, two, three hundred years ago, we didn't have television. Imagine a lot has changed since then. Women didn't vote. Uh, minorities didn't vote. So John Stuart Mill's views well, not, not, are not, not totally appropriate. Not all that much has changed in the Bible, or for that matter, in our Aristotle or, or Plato. Uh, I'll there, give them an exemption. Yeah. Okay. Well, we only have a few minutes left. But let me just touch on one more point in your really a, a quite extraordinary and interesting book uh, um, on drug control. Uh, I was hoping to see something there that was kind of bracing. And what do you know? The whole democratic platform ought to, or, or emphasis here ought to be less on enforcement and more on treatment. Lower demand instead of concentrating on supply. Now, I must have been in kindergarten when I first heard that formula. Why don't you brace it and say, go ahead and legalize the stuff, uh, and then, then treat people who are, are, are become heavy users? I'm a little confused. First, you said there are certain verities in the Bible and in John Stuart Mill that are still true. And then mm -hmm. you said, 
our idea for more treatment rather than pure enforcement is as old as you are. So no, but, but under, under old it, ideas aren't bad ideas. Oh, oh absolutely not, okay. provided, they, provided they're good. But uh, <laughs> I, I would hope uh, uh, that the first few paragraphs of that chapter deal with the utter failure of the war on drugs. Right. In fact, cocaine is cheaper and more and more people are addicted. But instead of, uh, instead of recommending something that would be really uh, bracing, uh, it, it goes back to the business of what we, we've got to re use, persuade people not to use drugs. Terrific idea. Yeah. Yeah. It would be bracing, and you're well known as being one of the only conservatives in America who, out of conscience, wants to legalize these drugs. The author of that, Matea Falco, who actually was advising Governor Clinton in his presidential campaign mm -hmm. on this issue, comes to the conclusion that when Reagan and Bush had 70 and 80 percent of the federal drug monies go to interdiction, mm -hmm. when no matter how many drugs you interdict, if the demand stays the same in America, there'll always be someone to ship right. in the cocaine. Right. Um, it now um, costs four to $5,000 per prisoner per year. That's it to have uh, the kind of drug education and rehabilitation which reduces by two-thirds the likelihood mm -hmm. they will commit a drug-related crime when they leave. Mm -hmm. What a sound investment. So all Ms. Falco urges is that we have not a 70-30 split between law enforcement and education and drug treatment, but a 50-50 split. Let's see if things work better. You want to legalize mm -hmm. it all the way, which well, we well, think will encourage if, drug if, use rather if, than deter it. I see your point. If, if what you're saying is cut down on enforcement to the point where those few people who do get caught no longer get caught, then in effect you have legalized it. Isn't that right? You know, if, if, if I can go out, uh, uh, right now, if I want to sell marijuana, as I understand, is a, a furtive step or two I need to take for self-protection, no longer under the uh, Mr. DeFalco's proposals, no, be because there wouldn't be money left over for the policeman to come and fetch me. Forget marijuana. Let's talk about really addicting drugs like cocaine. What she's saying is there will be fewer people using cocaine mm -hmm. uh, because half of our 600,000 prisoners at this moment are there for drug-related drug -related crimes. Yeah. And so if, and if they age and they're not kids who have this habit they can't kick, if they kick the habit, they're less likely to want it and engage in crime. So the crime bill goes down, drug use goes down, and I fear that under your creative proposal, if it's legal, it will go up. If you legalize cocaine, well, the use of cocaine might go up because there's still a law enforcement threat, um, even if it's not likely you'll get caught. Well, it, it's, it, in the first place, it's going up already, as your book tells us. In the second place, while it's going up, an awful lot of people are getting mugged, uh, stolen from, uh, uh, or whatever. There is nothing in these proposals that suggests that there will be a diminution in crime. Quite the contrary. If there are fewer policemen charged with keeping me from mugging somebody to buy my cocaine, I'll be free to mug more people for my cocaine, right? Uh, with scarce money, it's better to reduce the demand than the supply. If the demand is there, there'll always be mm -hmm. a supply, mm -hmm. which is a free market analyst, I'm sure you'd agree mm -hmm. with. Uh, but the, uh, beyond curing people who have already been enticed, how do you propose to diminish demand other than by the kind of change in ethos that has caused a drop in 14 points in tobacco consumption. Well, actually, a lot of these ads, uh, this is your brain on drugs, et cetera, that kind of good propaganda mm -hmm. has an educative effect if it's widespread enough. Um, and so it's both education and uh, uh, treatment we think works. But d d doesn't it have to do, uh, uh, Mark, also with uh, uh, a diminution of the of the hedonistic emphasis in life. The, the, the playboy philosophy says look only for, for pleasure uh, and enjoy the, uh, the rush of that pleasure. It seems to me that philosophy extends other than necessary to sex and is, is a, an invitation to self-abuse at almost every level, including drugs. The drug Bill, culture is associated with the 60s. Bill, I, I'm in government. I'm a student of government. I barely know government compared to culture. To figure out whether hedonism in society leads to drug use and how to diminish it is something that t 20 sociologists and philosophers and National Review editors can figure out uh, better than me. Bill Clinton can reduce drug use by being a model of a hard-working, cl clean-living guy who wants who to spend... Inhale. Who wants to... Well, he didn't. He had an allergy. <laughs> um, 
who can better reduce uh, demand than stop supply. No matter what you do as president, bully pulpit, moral pulpit notwithstanding, how do you affect what you call this hedonistic impulse from the 60s? Government can only do what it ought to do. Well, it seems to be one way you do it is by suggesting that the time really has stopped to emphasize rights, right to abort, uh, right uh, for gays to take over the St. Patrick's Parade, and, and suggest what are a citizen's duties. And one of those duties are to curb your appetites. I agree. That is straight from Bill the Clinton's Bible. inaugural address mm -hmm. and the Bible. He emphasized that he believes in Sacrifice, more opportunity yeah. and more responsibilities and more by government. citizens. Well, no, less, le less government in some places, more in others. <laughs> and uh, he believes in reciprocal responsibility. Whether you're a, a corporation that got a tax break to move into a town and you're fleeing, or you're a welfare recipient and you have the responsibility to get job training if it's offered. There are rights and there are responsibilities, which is probably the leading way, Bill, that he defines himself as a new Democrat. I, I mean, in sharp contrast with the Democrats we've got used to. Yeah. That's Prior Democrats idea. who engaged in what you could call interest group liberalism, which had rights without responsibilities, which were afraid, who were afraid to tell welfare recipients that for federal or state monies, limited as it is, you have certain obligation to the community that's helping you. Uh, this is what, uh, along with President Clinton's statement that we no longer should have something for nothing in his inaugural address, I think that's a, 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 I think it's a serious point. I thank you for making it. Thank you. Uh, this is Mark, Mark Green, the editor of Changing uh, America. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, from St. Elizabeth College. Next week on Firing Line, Shelby White, author of What Every Woman Should Know About Her Husband's Money, and law professor Mary Morris Winnick, try to convince host William F. Buckley, Jr. that community property laws are the only fair way to go. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, L. John Polite, Jr., and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449.